back in the 1980s and early 1990s where really evolutionary applications to human behavior um, and medicine flourished. I think many of you have heard me say before that it was hanging out with those people in the late 80s, early 90s, and I'd worked on evolution of senescence without actually knowing what I was doing, and they pointed me to this paper by uh, Bill Hamilton, or by George Williams, 1957. And that completely changed the course of my career. I mean, all of a sudden, I recognized antagonistic pleiotropy was the key to understanding aging. And if that was an explanation for aging, what about other aspects that were related to disease? You'll also maybe wonder why I keep inviting people from Michigan. Is it just because they're old friends? It's not really. It's because there was something magical in that atmosphere with Bill Hamilton and George Williams and Martin Daly and Beverly Strassman and Laura Betzig and Paul Turk and Bill Irons and Nap Shagnon and Richard e even, Alexander. Even that guy. I was saving you for last. But <laughs> <laughs> Kim Hill, Magdalena Hurtado. Uh, Bobby Lowe, Barbara Smuts, Richard Rangham, I mean, you name it. Everybody who was really central in developing this field early on happened to be there, and it made a fabulously synergistic mix. Um, Paul and Laura actually did their early research on their way to their anthropology PhDs on a tiny Pacific atoll called Ifaluk, uh, where they did some, I consider, groundbreaking research on the origins of the demographic transition and pointing out the role of parenting in that. Early on also, uh, Paul's work was a predecessor, Sarah Hurdy says, to her own ideas about cooperative parenting being the key to the origins of senescence. Um, after getting a PhD, uh, Paul came to the University of Michigan from Northwestern and got a postdoc with our program on evolution and human behavior. And that was actually one of the very first grants I helped rewrite. Richard Rangham wrote the original one, and I said, let's make it five times as much. We got it funded, and that made it possible for Paul to have a postdoc. He followed up from that with a membership in the Michigan Society of Fellows for two years. He then went to the University of Michigan Medical School and worked in a laboratory doing research on T-cell aging. Now that poisoned him for just being an anthropologist, and he subsequently went to uh, medical school, went back to University of Michigan, finished his pediatric residency, and now he is the world's first evolutionary pediatrician. He's been practicing in a private practice for the past 15 years, also working and publishing things. He has two articles I recommend to you, one in a quarterly review about the evolution of aging, trying to understand what it means, Ackerman's discovery of bacterial aging, for our general antagonic supplier trooper theory, and a more recent one I've just become aware of on the evolution of sex as rejuvenation in evolutionary biology in 2013. How many doctors are there who know as much evolution as he does and are practicing? Maybe two or three in the whole world. And how he does this in the, mad, in the midst of practice, I really don't know. And we're especially grateful to him for coming because in contrast to those of us who are privileged to travel a bit and have our salaries keep coming, he comes here and the income stops. Uh, for several days um, while he's here. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say, Paul. His topic today is how and why we reboot some clinical implications. Okay, is this uh, working? Sounds like it. So thanks, Randy. Um, you know, how I do it is by being very slow. It's like one paper every three or four years, or if that. But, uh, um, I want to I want to start with uh, let's see this is this right here let's, I think it is yeah that's fine I just want to see if it's going to click to the next one yeah so 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 let's go to that I wanted to start just by saying that I have a, a, a granddaughter now she's nine months old uh, her name's Caroline uh, she's uh, spectacular and um, about two months ago, she started to crawl, and so she would be on things, you know, a bed or a couch, and she'd crawl to the edge of it, and she'd want to just go right over head first, and so we would stop her, and at that point, she and I, we started to have little chats about gravity, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she's finally starting to get it, uh, but I bring this up because there are a lot of things that life has to deal with universally, and one of those things is gravity, and the other things are the other laws of physics, of course, and uh, uh, the laws of physics are aptly named because it, they're not called the laws of biology because they're generally the wrong level of focus uh, for us, but we nevertheless do have to take them into account. The, the correct level of focus for us, the sort of things that we have to deal with uh, as life forms on, a, on an everyday basis are figuring out ways to survive and uh, to reproduce. 
And, uh, and because they're, uh, they're two of the three important Im imperatives, they're, they're the uh, uh, things that a lot of uh, biologists of all sorts and health uh, scientists focus on. I think you know hundreds of thousands of people really kind of go to, if you include medical people, go to work every day on trying to figure out how we survive and how we reproduce. And as a result, we've learned a lot about uh, those things. And one of the important things we've learned, uh, important uh, from my perspective per, uh, especially, is that uh, the way they interact, the way they trade off against one another, leads to the evolution of senescence. And it's looking more and more like uh, no organism can avoid uh, evolving uh, to senesce. And so because senescence is ubiquitous, we have a, what I, a third imperative, which I emphasize in big letters in red here, because it, it, uh, I think it's extremely important, but it flies under the radar. Unlike uh, working on survival and reproduction, very few people uh, uh, look, at, look at this or, or study it. Not, it's not no one, of course, but uh, 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 relatively speaking, it's, it's not uh, emphasized nearly as much. And I think, I think that omission's uh, a, a mistake. It, it, it would be no less of a mistake, I think, if, if I were to stand up here and say, you know, guys, there's this thing called reproduction. We ought to pay attention to that. We ought to look at how organisms do it. You know, there's not just the way we do it. There's parthenogenesis, there's fission, there's vegetative reproduction, and there's uh, dozens and dozens and hundreds and hundreds of mechanisms that have evolved to allow us to pull off these different types of, of reproduction. And there's whole fields of study. There's sexual selection, there's parental investment, there's mate choice, all kinds of things that we should be looking at. And if I were successful in, con in convincing you, you'd leave here and you'd go and you'd say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to start studying reproduction. Well, if I'm successful today, uh, you'll, you'll go back to your labs and say, all right, now we gotta, we got to look at how animals or, or organisms in general make young from old. So it's a big goal, and uh, I don't really expect everybody to switch, but, uh, you know, well, we'll, we'll see. Um, okay, uh, so what do I mean by making young from old? I want to just paint some pictures here. So first picture is me, I'm old. You know, gray hair, uh, wrinkles, whatever this little thing is that's started to appear. Uh, and, and, you know, that's just the start of it. I can't run as fast as I could. Lots of things inside undoubtedly aren't working as well as they used to. Um, you know, some things still work, uh, for example, and, and I won't uh, uh, give details, and, and I certainly won't show pictures, but, but I can still make a baby, and uh, um, <laughs> don't choke, Randy, um, I, but, uh, and if I did do that, it would be born young. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be born uh, 62, uh, it wouldn't be born with wrinkles or, or gray hair, and, and, and this doesn't just happen willy-nilly. There are Lots and lots of mechanisms that have evolved over the ages to make sure that this happens. And it's actually, has, has, the, the need to make young from old actually has an evolutionary history that probably goes back about three and a half billion years. All right, so here's a prettier picture. That's my daughter, Alexa, a cancer biologist I was telling you about. She and her husband getting married a few years ago. And uh, they're 26 and 27 there, but they've already begun senescing. And how do we know that they've begun senescing? It's because George Williams predicted that they would in 57, and George is almost always right. Uh, and, uh, but how we really know is that Randy, uh, I think it was in 88, assembled a bunch of life table uh, for a bunch of different organisms and showed that senescence really does begin to creep in uh, at, a, at a relatively early age. As George predicted, it's supposed to start at about the age of typical first reproduction for a species. And uh, I think it, uh, it does. All right, so uh, here's the young gravity scholar, uh, Caroline. And um, she's not senescent at all, nor should she be, because she hasn't reached the typical age of first reproduction. But I put the slide up here because I want to talk about totipotency. Um, in, the, in the general um, you know, etymological sense of the term, it means uh, having uh, total potential. And she has total potential to grow up to do everything that a member of our species uh, uh, needs to do to be successful. And she will be totipotent in that sense until she gets to that age of first reproduction and begins down the path towards senescence. And then she'll gradually, like all of her ancestors, lose totipotency in that general sense. There, of course, is another more familiar way to use the term, and it's the way it's usually used in biology. And it refers to a cell 
that has total potential to become all the different cells uh, in the body that we all need in order to uh, prosper. And so uh, she's nine months old, so 18 months ago she was a zygote and she was totipotent then in this sense. She's no longer totipotent uh, because the zygote is divided, cells have differentiated, and you know she grew like we all did at one time or another, all the organs that we need, you know, brains and eyes and uh, lungs and kidneys and so on, and that's good. Of course, we need those, uh, you know, highly specialized, uh, highly complex uh, organs, uh, 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 which are uh, uh, adaptations. And so there's a good side to this, and, uh, and, but then there's this bad side. Uh, and as I said, she's no longer able to produce all the cells and all the uh, cell types and all the things she would need uh, to, to, pre to prevent damage and to repair things and so on. So although she's not senescent yet, she's already traveled down a pathway that's going to set her up, you know, 15, 16, 18 years from now to take that first step on the senescence trail. And uh, uh, as I said, you know, there's good in that and there's bad in that, so you might know where I'm heading with this. I'm heading towards uh, antagonistic uh, pleiotropy. But let's uh, go ahead and just summarize uh, the, uh, the, the Medawar Williams theory of the evolution of senescence. Uh, and, and I'd say I, I would call it the evolution of senescence with a capital T-H-E because there really isn't another one that's... Uh, uh, credible in my mind. Uh, tell me if you disagree with that uh, later on. But uh, it has three moving parts. Um, it has uh, uh, genes with age effects. You need that for senescence to evolve. Uh, Medawar proposed genes that are neutral or uh, don't have any effects at all early, but then have negative effects late. Williams uh, proposed, and, or at least emphasized, uh, so-called antagonistic pleiotropic genes. Those are genes that have positive effects early and negative effects late. Um, both of them require the second moving part there, weakening selection to uh, have any effects or to get to accumulate in, uh, uh, in uh, organisms. So uh, in the first case for the metawire type genes, you get selection weakening and it gets so weak eventually <laughs> that selection is unable to remove these genes that sort of drift into the system. In the Williams case, you get direct selection for uh, antagonistic pleiotropic genes because you have a positive effect early. You have that weakening selection that discounts the negative effect, so you get a net positive for certain antagonistic pleiotropic genes, and they get uh, accumulated in, into our genomes in, in that way. And so these are the things that uh, evolutionary senescence theorists have devoted almost all of their attention to. Uh, a lot of empirical studies trying to sort out which is more important for senescence, the Medawar genes or the, or the, or the uh, Williams type genes, and it's the Williams type genes, just uh, uh, so you know, uh, but, uh, and the people will disagree with that. Um, and uh, a lot of people have worked on the weakening of selection idea. Hamilton, in his famous 66 paper, uh, you know, showed mathematically that uh, the force of selection does begin to decline at uh, generally about the age of first reproduction, as Williams uh, said it would, which is why senescence is supposed to be in creeping in at this, that age. And uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Charlesworth wrote, wrote a whole book on this uh, topic, uh, Selection in Age-Structured Populations, I think it was called in 1980. So tons and tons of work been done on this and not very much been done on uh, the other moving part uh, called germ soma separation. Now, if a lot of people had been working on that, I wouldn't have been able to say at the beginning that nobody works or very few people work on making young for, from old because in a, in a phrase, and uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's how we make young from old. Now that's missing all the details and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, here, here in a minute, but, but that's, that's the general solution to the problem of making young for, from old, and it's to keep a portion of the uh, uh, body or the, or the, or the individual the organism separate uh, from the other part. So, so it, it goes back to uh, August Weissman, I believe, in, I think it was in the early 1890s, where he uh, proposed the concept of a germ plasm. And he did that because he was trying to figure out why senescence evolves. And sort of in a, 
you know, a, a no-duh kind of way. He said, well, if you're going to have any model of senescence that works, you have to keep some part of the organism free of it so that you can, you know, at age 62, not produce a baby that's uh, uh, 62 on the inside. So I, I think, you know, it's hard for me to know why people haven't focused on this very much, as important as it is, but I think it's just that, that uh, it's, it's so obvious you, you, you need it. And, um, and so uh, it, it was sort of accepted for years that that's what you need. Things changed eventually, and I'll tell you about that. But uh, up until 1991, when Michael Rose published his sort of definitive treatment on the evolution of uh, aging, his, his book, which at the time was sort of, you know, the, the, the Bible in that, in that respect, uh, he, he pointed out in there that uh, germ soma separation is fundamental, that you just have to have it, and he made uh, the prediction, he said it was the most clear-cut prediction from the Meadow R. Williams theory that if you don't have germ soma separation, you don't get uh, uh, evolution of senescence. And then a few sentences later he said, and of course bacteria don't exhibit germ soma separation, so they won't be expected uh, to senesce. Well, things change. Uh, it was in 2003 that Randy mentioned him, uh, Martin Ackerman at all, including our own Steve Stearns as the co-author on this paper. They published paper in Science uh, showing that uh, bacteria do senesce. Uh, this particular uh, species is what they were looking at, C. crescentis. C. crescentis is a weird bacterium. Uh, it's, it's very complex compared to most. It's very asymmetrical. You got this big uh, uh, side, so it's dividing here, and you have a stalk that this, that's growing here, and that stalk anchors to a substrate, and then what the bacterium does is it pinches off these smaller, they might not look smaller on this slide, but this smaller swarmer cell, and the swarmer cells are potentially immortal, but the stalk cell, as it pinches them off uh, three, four, five, six times, it goes on to accumulate damage and senesce. And so, um, Ackerman at all, they didn't see how that really could be described as having germs uh, or having germ soma separation. So they glommed on to this idea that what you really need is asymmetry for senescence to evolve. And uh, they, they hearkened back to a paper by uh, uh, Partridge and Barton, which ironically was published the same year that Michael Rose was saying the opposite thing. Uh, in that paper, Partridge and Barton said they didn't find the germ soma separation idea very compelling. Uh, and instead, they, they thought that what you really need is a, a larger mother that produces smaller offspring. You need that particular kind of asymmetry for senescence to evolve. And uh, the paper really didn't get all that much attention until this one came along. And uh, Ackerman et al. cite it approvingly because it, it appears to fit pretty well. Um, but as I said before, things happen, things change, and uh, two years later, in 2005, Eric Stewart uh, discovered, Eric Stewart et al., in a, in a close uh, paper, discovered that uh, E. coli senesce. And uh, really cool paper, you should read it if you get a chance, but uh, uh, E. coli is a much more typical bacterium, a much more common, a much more well-known uh, bacterium, and as you can see there, there's none of this big mother cell, small offspring being uh, produced. They divide morphologically, symmetrically. And so that part of the Partridge and Bar Barton idea went out the window, but uh, Stewart et al. clung to the idea that you need, what you need is asymmetry, and I'll describe uh, uh, the functional asymmetry that they found. So they, so they so, so they also discarded the idea that you need germ soma senescence, they, or germ soma separation, and said what you need is asymmetry, but not necessarily a morphological one. So this is kind of what's going on here. If I can walk over here a little, you've got, uh, you know, the mother cell. This is a bacterial rod, which E. coli is. You've got it beginning to divide. And the, the neat thing that happens here is that when, when it does divide, at each end here, new molecules have to be synthesized, and they become the new pole. Those are marked in blue. And so when it's fully, fully separated, you've got uh, a new pole here and a new pole here. But if you go back up here, uh, uh, one, of these cell, one of these poles was made just a generation before, so it's one generation old. The other one had to have been made up there. 
So it's at least two, three, four, maybe five generations old. So you've got uh, the generation of old pole cells. And what happens is the old pole cells, they're the ones that senesce. They have lower uh, survivorship and they have a slower time to reproduction, uh, slower time to division. Whereas remarkably, they were, Stuart and all were able to show this too, this new pole cell over here, not only does it not senesce, but it has a fitness advantage. It, uh, it, it reproduces faster and it has a, a, a lower uh, rate of mortality, so better survivorship. So, so that's, pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, well, uh, in 2006, uh, Milan Watvi, uh, kind of a mathematical evolutionary biologist who was here at your conference in March, I got to talk to him, great guy. He published a paper in uh, uh, PNAS and he called what's going on here a conditional choice, or he called aging in bacteria a conditional choice. And so what he meant by that was, it, is it doesn't have to work that way. What could go on here is this cell that's still the mother cell or two proto-daughter cells could devote uh, effort to bringing this older part up to snuff, up to par with this part side. So you could get uh, the elimination of this functional asymmetry. You could get uh, both cells equally totipotent, to bring that word back up again. Uh, but E. coli apparently don't choose to do that, and so they, they travel down a pathway that leads to uh, senescence. So in 2008, I published a paper Randy mentioned in a uh, 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 quarterly review of biology, which uh, added some other things to this. I said, okay, well, um, so this choice, this choice to not use resources allows this new pole cell to use resources. It, it keeps the pool available, which accounts for the fact that it has higher fitness. I said, that's, that's a reproductive transaction. That's nepotism. And so when these two cells finally separate and become independent, this one's already reproduced. She did it up here before she was even separate. And so what causes the declining force of selection to occur? It's using up some of your reproductive potential. It's, it's leaving yourself with a lower residual reproductive potential, to use William's term. So what's actually happened here is by the time this daughter sells an independent entity, she's already reproduced some. The force of selection acting on her has already reduced some. And so that's, remember, that's one of the moving parts in the evolution of senescence model. You need the force of selection to decline. And what about uh, age effect genes? Well, again, uh, this, this decision not to make both cells equal, to leave them functionally asymmetrical, uh, that's guided uh, presumably by genes. And uh, they are, uh, uh, by all accounts, antagonistic pleiotropic genes because what happens? By making that decision, you get this instant uh, advantage in fitness for the new pole cell Whereas by not doing maintenance, it takes a while for uh, damage and senescence to creep in and become significant. So you've got a positive effect happening right away, and you have a delayed negative effect happening. And so that, that's, uh, I mean, that's an antagonistic pleiotropic gene there. So you've got both things happening. All right, so uh, what about uh, separation of uh, uh, germ and soma? So this is, this is the part that you know, gets me in trouble a little bit. But uh, uh, so here's what I think is happening there. I, I don't like to define separation as a thing. You know, if, if, if you've got gametes and you've got the germplasm in there, then you've, uh, and you keep it separate from the rest of the body, then you've got germ soma separation. Uh, I, 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 I like to think of it more as a process. And what, what is the process? What was uh, um, uh, Weissman really thinking when he, when he conceived the concept of germplasm. He was thinking we got to keep this portion of, uh, of the organism over here separate and we got to keep it totipotent. We have to keep it having full potential. So we have to do things that, that preferentially preserve that. And so the decision being made in E. coli according to Watt V's decisional choice model does just that. It preferentially preserves the new pole cell and it lets the other side uh, accumulate damage and, and senesce. So, so what's a soma? A soma is a part that, uh, uh, of the body that supports the germline and eventually tries to get it into the next generation. 
So I've said that you really don't have to discard this germ soma separation uh, idea. You have to discard the idea that it's something only multicellular organisms can do because only they can make distinctly separate uh, gametes. But all you have to do is think of it as an incremental process. And the E. coli uh, and the Colobacter crescentis organism that I showed you pictures of are doing a little bit of it. And then if you, you know, maybe you question that. So, but let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Let's look at organisms like us, big mammals. We now know from uh, epigenetic studies that uh, we're not fully separating uh, germline and soma either. A, a, a person can get exposed to a toxin and three generations later, those epigenetic changes are still being transmitted. Uh, they're still being felt by that offspring. They're negative, selection uh, would like, if selection can like, would like to get rid of them. Uh, but it's, but, but, but it, it's not able to, uh, not, at, not at this point. So over three and a half billion years since the first bacterium likely evolved uh, germ soma separation and then started us down the pathway to senescence, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of lots of increments have been added that allow us, big complex organisms like us, filled with all kinds of senescent qualities to still uh, make young from old. And so that, that's what I'd really like uh, everybody to uh, you know, take uh, uh, a more of a look at if, if, if you find it uh, a compelling argument. All right, so, so if evolving a separate germline from the soma is one of the preconditions for the evolution of senescence, and don't misunderstand, I'm not ever saying that senescence is a good thing, that you're trying to evolve it. But if that's what it takes for senescence to evolve, why did life ever take that path? Senescence is a bad thing, right? Um, so, so, so why do that? Well, the answer that, uh, you know, you can search around and sort of find people hinting away at it. Uh, uh, Tom Kirkwood, great guy, uh, I think comes closest to really giving us a cogent argument for that. Um, but, but I think it, it's really that the evolution of adaptive complexity requires us to be able to discard or dispose of part of, of the soma. That if you have to maintain everything perfectly for complex adaptations for a long, long time, it just gets too expensive. And so the, the easiest way I can explain that, and, and it's not a perfect analogy, but I call it the Ferrari principle. Um, you know, Ferraris are expensive and they can do wonderful things though. If you really want to go around a corner at 150 miles an hour, you don't buy a Ford Focus. You have to have, yeah, you got to have a Ferrari, right? So it can do lots of things. It's very specialized, it's very complex, it's very precise. And I see the tree of life as uh, being comprised of uh, lots of different Ferraris and not so much uh, 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 generalists. Uh, there, there are millions of niches out there and millions of different specialized organisms with specialized adaptations that have evolved to fill those niches. So they're Ferrari-like in that respect. And we couldn't do it if we couldn't discard it before we had to pay the maintenance on it. So as a pediatrician, I'm at the bottom of the reimbursement hierarchy in medicine. I probably couldn't afford a Ferrari, but if they did a two-year lease on one and I really wanted it, maybe I could pull that off. But the key for me would be that I, had to, I could get rid of it in two years. If, I, if you told me, I, well, you're going to get a Ferrari, Paul, at 16, and that's the only car uh, you can have for your whole life, I probably would have been happy because I was 16. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, but it wouldn't have worked out very well because there's just no way I could have afforded the maintenance on a, on a Ferrari. So the only way I could have one is if I can get rid of it. And the only way that we all can have uh, uh, evolved complex adaptations is if we don't have to maintain them forever and we can dispose of them eventually. So I can go on and on about that, and I, but I won't. Uh, um, Williams in his 57 paper said uh, you're getting into dicey territory if you start to compare machines to organisms when it comes to senescence and I, and I just sort of did that here. So I want to go back to the biology of it. Um, and so remember what I told you about you know, starting as a zygote and, develop, and developing? Well, complexity develops. It's a developmental process. Cells differentiate and we get all these diff specialized cells and, and tissues and so on. Uh, and that is adaptive. We need those things. We need our hearts. We need our lungs. We need our kidneys. Uh, but that development, because the totipotency, the ability to make all the parts that we did 
uh, from scratch at one time goes away as we, as we transition from, you know, to terminally differentiated cells. Uh, so, I mean, let, let me put it this way. I, I uh, uh, you know, have some uh, pluripotent stem cells around that if I had some kidney damage, they could affect some repair. But if I really had severe damage, I'm out of luck. I, and I certainly couldn't grow a new pair of kidneys. The only way I'm left to, to make a new pair of kidneys, the only option I have is indirectly by reproducing and rebooting and starting over. That, that's it. And, and I'm, I'm trapped into that system uh, because uh, I need those complex adaptations. So development, bottom line, is antagonistically pleiotropic. So uh, why people have debated for years whether uh, there's enough antagonistic pleiotropy out there to account for senescence is beyond me because antagonistic pleiotropy is everywhere. It's in every aspect of our development. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. We're gonna go off to the clinic because I'm a practicing physician, so people like me to talk about clinical stuff, and I, and I will. Um, microbial parasites versus uh, the immune system. Uh, that's, the, that's the theme here. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, it's been an arms race. It's been a long arms race ever since there was uh, uh, one small organism trying to evade a, a bigger organism. You know, we, we've, there's been an arms race that's led to the evolution of immune systems. Um, I think the self-non-self distinction is the dominant theme in any battle uh, uh, between uh, microbial parasite and uh, the, the larger host that it's trying to infect. And the reason I think that is because it's, just, it's, funda it's fundamental. You, you're, that's the most fundamental thing your immune system has to be able to do. It has to be able to know the difference between friend and foe. And as I said, it's, a, it, it, it's an arm race, arms race. It's not an easy thing to do because Germs, as you all know, they evolve very quickly. They're devious because of that. They like to hide out from the immune system. The best approach if you're a germ is to not, not get noticed by the immune system. And so they hide inside cells. They coat themselves with proteins that look like uh, the, the organism they're invading and so on. And they, and they try to escape and they, and they sometimes win. Um, but uh, any chance for victory for organisms like us, organisms like us that, ha us that have uh, T cells and a thymus hinges on what's called uh, education by the thymus. So let me just say a little bit about what T cells are. They're, all components of the immune system are important, but I consider T cells, maybe because I worked on them, to be the most important. So you, you, you've all heard of uh, uh, helper T cells, as the CD4 positive T cells that the HIV infects and, and kills. So when HIV takes over and infects and kills a lot of helper T cells, AIDS ensues, and we all know that that means you got a very dysfunctional immune system. So, so T cells are very, very, very important. And the thymus is involved in educating them. And, and how, do, how does that work? It, it educates them with respect to uh, knowing whether we're dealing with self or non-self. So it's, 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 it's teaching the immune system, T cells in particular, what to be tolerant of and what not to. And it works like this. So all blood cells originate in the bone marrow. Those that are destined to become T cells uh, migrate to the thymus and uh, there they're presented with antigen. And uh, all these T cells have receptors and so if they lock onto that antigen they're being presented and they lock on tightly and a few other, I'm glossing over details, but a few other things go, go on that, that t young T cell that's in the thymus that locks on tightly is uh, signaled to commit suicide. It's, it's told to undergo apoptosis. And, and that's what you want because that's a T cell that's going to uh, react to self-antigen because in the thymus, that's what the thymus is supposed to be presenting, only self-antigen. So, so that, that, that's an important point. All right. Um, now, so the war is rife with antagonistic <laughs> pleiotropies, and here's a conundrum. Uh, the thymus is so important, right? It's, it's, it's educating these T cells uh, and it's educating them on the most important thing that, a, that an immune system does, which is distinguish self from non-self. And yet the thymus is at its best in, the feet, in, the, in a fetus. That's when it's biggest, that's when its output is greatest, that's when it's working hardest and working most efficiently. Shortly after we're born, the thymus starts to shrink up or involute and uh, before too long, it becomes a mere shadow of its former self. And so you might ask yourself, uh, 
uh, as I did back when I worked in an immunology lab. Well, why, why in the heck is that, that happening? The T cells are so important, the thymus is so important in, in uh, producing and educating them, so why does the thymus uh, go to hell in a handbasket you know, so quickly? I think of it, Kim, sort of as a, uh, like the uh, uh, menopause problem, you know, ovaries, other things being equal, keeping them going a little longer would be a good thing, and I, I would think that would be true of the thymus also. Um, so what's, what's happening here? Well, I've told you how the thymus works. The antigen presented in the thymus is supposed to be self-antigen, correct? What happens uh, when these devious germs get in the thymus and have them, their proteins presented? They, they, they delete the T cells that would be capable of reacting to them because the, the immune system reads them as self. So there's been a long coevolution of germs trying to pull this trick off. And so there's been a long evolution of, uh, on the part of hosts to try to outdo those germs. And so they want to perform this thymic, we want to perform this thymic education at the time when it's most likely that the sinus is truly presenting self-antigen. And that is when we're in utero. That is when mom's fully armed and developed immune system is offering protection and keeping germs out of the fetus. Now, it's not perfect. Some fetuses get infections and, you know, and succumb because of it, but it's pretty, pretty rare. Uh, once kids are out on the outside, especially if they go to daycare, they're getting a new infection every two weeks. Fetuses don't, don't get infected very often, thankfully. So if uh, you want to uh, uh, have the thymus in a situation where it can do its job best and reliably distinguish self from non-self, you better do it while it's in utero. And so, again, bringing the antagonistic pleiotropic angle back in, anything you can do to make that thymus work fast and efficiently early on, selection is going to favor even if there are attached negative effects. Even if you have to, let me put it to you this way. Let's suppose you were put in charge of the resources for building the thymus, making it work, and maintaining it. If the only way you could make the thymus work really well is, uh, or, or, or if the thymus works really well in utero and you really need it to work fast and hard then, you're going to divide those resources up by giving most of them to the thymus at that time and you're going to say the heck with maintenance downstream. I don't care what happens then. Not only because the force of selection is declining, but also because the thymus can't do its job once, it's on the outs once the baby's on the outside nearly as well as it once could. All right, uh, I know that was sort of fast and we're going to go to a couple other quick things that have to do with the clinic. Um, so based on what I've been telling you about making young from old and how the thymus works, let's talk about vaccines. The Tdap is tetanus, de uh, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis. Pertussis is a big problem right now because people don't get immunizations for their kids and so there's pertussis or whooping cough epidemics. And babies are really vulnerable pertussis in the first uh, uh, two months of their life. If they get it then, they're going to be in the ICU for a while and they still might die. So the powers that be wisely probably said, well, let's uh, inoculate uh, women in their third trimester with the Tdap. They'll produce antibodies. Those IgG antibodies will cross the placenta. They'll persist in the baby for a time after it's born and offer protection in those very vulnerable first two months. That's great, and there's actually good evidence that that, that happens. But my theoretical concern, given what we now just went over about how the thymus works and when tolerance develops is what happens if, uh, we'll focus on pertussis, what happens if pertussis antigen uh, that's uh, supposed to be stimulating mom's immune system to produce these antibodies gets into the fetal thymus, which it probably does. Is pertussis, is, is the immune system being taught that pertussis is self? Are whole subsets of T cells being deleted that could go on to control pertussis infection later in life? I don't think anybody knows, and maybe I'm just uh, a, a naive uh, because I, I'm really not that close to immunology anymore, but I can't find anybody who, who's looking at this or even considering the problem because I don't think anybody's looking at the evolutionary arms race that goes on. Um, but please, let me know if you know of uh, uh, some stuff on this. So if that happens with uh, uh, Tdap and it could turn out bad, 
Uh, I'm even more worried about flu shots. Influenza has killed more people in the last 100 years than two world wars have. It's a very, very nasty virus. And uh, ever since the H1N1 uh, scare back in 2009, H1N1 was really hard on pregnant women. It killed a lot of them. So the recommendation came to uh, uh, immunize uh, pregnant women with flu shots. We never used to do that. We were always a little leery of it. Well, are we, uh, does that flu influenza antigen get into the fetal thymus? Are, 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 uh, is the immune system being trained to think of influenza as self? Are whole subsets of T cells that uh, being eliminated? Uh, that could go on to control uh, uh, influenza infection for the rest of uh, the individual's life. Maybe I should add, I, I kind of left this out. T cells live a very, very long time. The ones that are made in your thymus can live for your whole lifetime and exist for your whole lifetime, either as that individual itself or as clones. So, uh, and the clones inherit the education. So, you know, I don't know. These are, are questions that I think need to be asked, and they don't get asked, I don't think, because uh, uh, too few doctors consider evolution. All right, so the thymus, the, 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 early in life, as a, as a fetus, and, you know, in the first few months of life, that's when we're most uh, effective at uh, teaching the immune system tolerance. So, uh, what about uh, peanut antigen? Should, should the fetus be exposed to it? Those of you who have kids know that peanut allergies have really been on the increase and they're really, really severe. Uh, and so allergists for a long, long time now, for a couple decades probably, have been recommending that if you're pregnant, don't eat peanuts. If uh, uh, your child's under two or three years of age, don't give him or her uh, peanuts. And uh, Based on what I've just been telling you, though, uh, that's probably exactly the, the wrong advice because that's when uh, our T-cell system should be learning tolerance to peanut antigen. So this slide would have been worth a lot more uh, uh, if I had been up here a couple years ago with it because I've thought of it long ago and have been telling uh, people who are interested about it long ago. But in 2014, in December, in the New England Journal of Medicine, a couple articles were published showing that if you feed mom's peanut butter while, she, while she's pregnant, the baby is way, way, way less likely to develop peanut allergy. Okay. Uh, I'm probably getting close to running out of time here, or maybe not, but uh, what about other food allergies? Uh, could it be the same thing? Could it be that our exposure to them is mistimed? Um, and so to, to talk a little bit about this, uh, what I mean, I wanna go to, I think, the second to the last slide here um, and talk about how we used to ingest foods uh, way back when, and how Kim can uh, let me know if I'm wrong about this, how, how hunter-gatherers even today probably do it. So Marlene Zuck, as many of you know, published a book recently called Paleo Fantasy, and I love the book, and I think she punctures a lot of the weird and outrageous thing that, things that the paleo movement people uh, have been all about. But I think, and Marlene says this in the book, she says, now don't get me wrong, I think we can learn a lot about what's an optimal diet and optimal exercise and so on by looking into the past. Um, it's just been taken to extremes by, by certain people. But the, sort of what I distill out of the paleo uh, movement, especially with respect to diet, is that what we used to eat was a lot of variety, but not very much novelty. And uh, what I mean by that is, you know, let's suppose you were a hunter-gatherer living uh, 100,000 years ago, and you lived in a place where there was a little bit of seasonality. So over a 12-month period, you would be exposed to the same plants and the same animals sort of on a cyclical basis and so on. And year after year after year, that same sort of thing would happen. It may take tens of thousands of years for climate change or something like that to cause or, or migration patterns to occur to have it occur to have it happen where people who eat the same variety of things over and over and over again all of a sudden are introduced to a new food source you know maybe something that uh, uh, didn't exist then so if we compare you know somebody what a hunter gatherer ate uh, 10,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago well th there would be novelty on that evolutionary scale but there isn't novelty 
on the, on the scale of, of a lifetime for most uh, hunter-gatherers unless they come into contact with modern populations. Um, and so when mom ingests food, when baby's inside, that antigen gets expressed in the thymus, mom develops tolerance to it, and uh, so baby has tolerance to all the foods that mom has exposed baby to during fetal development and then also in the first five, six, seven, eight months, months of life. So fast forward to now and you've got a kid born and maybe mom is you know, one of these people who eats a very restricted diet and uh, when the a child turns six, he goes to the next door neighbor's house and they're very adventurous eaters and he gets shrimp for the first time. Well, first time you're exposed, no problem. Second time, maybe no problem. Third time, those T cells that didn't get deleted in utero like they should have been, uh, get activated and the kid's in anaphylactic shock and you got a real problem there. So I think uh, by uh, uh, paying attention to uh, the ways we used to eat in the past and sort of trying to mimic uh, that, you know, not, I don't mean that you, you have to go out and try to eat, you know, buffalo instead of cows or things like that. But you, you have to try to eat a lot of variety and you have to try to avoid things that have a lot of novelty. So if, if uh, uh, nutritionists had been thinking along those lines, they wouldn't have told uh, us like they did during mine and Randy's generation when we were growing up to eat a lot of margarine, you know, which is full of entirely novel trans fats. So anyway, that's a whole different story. Um, the, everything I've told you today, or most of what I've told you today is in three papers that I published. As I said, I'm pretty slow. 95, I published uh, the microbial parasites versus developing T cells paper in the journal Thymus. That was right in the middle of medical school. That, that saved my life because I was so bored with memorizing the Krebs cycle another time that I needed to think. Uh, then I published the, the Williams paper in 2008. And then uh, if you're only gonna read one paper of mine, uh, read the 2013 paper. I think it's the best paper I've ever published. And then some of what's in there is in, uh, I'm writing a book called Bringing Up Baby and Evolutionary View to Pediatrics. About halfway done with it now, looking for uh, a publisher. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I've had to say about the immunizations and al food allergies and so on is in chapter four, which I call Babies Gone Viral. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Is this on already? You can't. It won't make you louder, but it will okay. So y your basic premise of, of baby thymic uh, immigrants being educated has a problem in that, in fact, naive T cells mm -hmm. have a very short li uh, lifespan. Right. So their, their lifespan is only on the order of a couple months in yeah. humans. Yeah. So saying that, that early on that those are then going to somehow prevent uh, allergic responses later on doesn't really make sense because those those T cells are no longer there anyways. Well, I'm not so sure that, that, that that's true. I, I, I know that... Uh, <coughs> uh, if you're talking about deletion, yeah. then, then that is true. But if you're talking about tolerance in terms of, of either regulatory cells or cells that are intentionally inhibiting responses, right. Right. Those can be long-lived cells right. And, right. and could potentially have that. But, but that's, that not, that's not a function of thymus. That's a function of actually educating them in a different environment. Mm -hmm. So I have a hard time understanding how uh, central tolerance mechanisms that you're talking about mm -hmm. are going to actually limit that for long-term mm -hmm. uh, in, in an individual. Well, I, I guess, I mean, maybe, maybe the problem comes with, uh, I, I worked on T cells with, with mice, but what, what we found was uh, in Rich Miller's lab that the naive T cells didn't necessarily have short lives, that they had short lives maybe as individuals, but as clones of one another that uh, uh, maintain the, ed the education uh, uh, process. That the, the work from Oregon Health Sciences in mice, the half-life is even shorter. The half-life mm -hmm. of T cells on a clone level yeah. is only about 30 days. Yeah. Well, uh, but the, but the, again, they, they, the cloning is a is a process that can go on over and over again. No, but if you're talking about 
central tolerance, creating these holes in the repertoire, uh -huh. the T cell receptor repertoire, uh -huh. due to deletion. Uh -huh. Those holes are going to be transient, because they're only going to be around for a month or so after that child is born, uh -huh. when that baby, that mouse is born. Uh -huh. and then those holes are going to disappear, and that repertoire we already know of T cell receptors changes over time. Uh -huh. Well, I, I, I don't know. You, you may be right. That, that's not the, the way that I, I, I learned it. I learned that they were long-lived and that they lived as clones of one another and that uh, you produce them as uh, a, an infant and, and many of them can be there for life. And, they, and in fact, the problem with the immune system becomes over time is that you have too many of them converted to memory cells and they're, they're it's great to have memory cells, but uh, once organisms evolved and you're, and you're no longer fighting the same germ, then you're stuck with a T cell repertoire that uh, is, is filled with obsolete cells. Yeah, that's, that's, and we know that that's not how T cells work anymore. That, that in fact, the, if you even do the math of calculating the clonal per percentage of T cells, mm -hmm. that over, uh, if you want to look, want to look at the lifespan, mm -hmm. In a couple of years, you've basically turned over 100 percent of the population. Well, so I'm going to make sure we get other questions yeah. here. I'd love to see. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, can can I uh, yeah. give you my email address and I'll send you a, a, a paper that I just read that uh, contests that? But uh, uh, um, uh, but uh, I'd love to learn more about it. Okay. Um, so my question was also about the thymus, but with the understanding that there's still things to be determined. Um, I was really amazed a couple of weeks ago that we now have premature infants that are born at 23 weeks gestation age that are surviving. Mm -hmm. So setting aside the incredible suite of challenges that they face, what might this mean for the timing of their thymus involution? Do the, does the thymus involute in premature infants the same way it does in full-term infants? What, how does this change the education of their immune response to them to themselves? Are they going to be at greater risk for autoimmune disorders? Uh, that that's really a good question, and, and I, I I mean it's a great question. I just don't have the answer to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this question actually relates to senescence that you're talking. This question relates to the senescence you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So what is its role in cells that don't normally divide, like neurons? What is its so what, Well, th so th those cells are terminally differentiated. Uh, they, in their, yeah, th I mean, they don't normal, normally divide. Uh, but uh, it's, I, I, don't, I don't think that affects the, the general, general argument. The general argument is it's, it's hard to repair the brain if it becomes damaged, in part because those cells don't uh, uh, keep, uh, maintain the potential to divide, and they're terminally differentiated. So, okay. Great talk. I enjoyed that very much. Thank um, you. I'm, I'm curious, when you're, uh, from, with your clinical perspective, um, when you talk to either pediatric residents or medical students, what is the one thing that you emphasize most or think that they're missing out on in their education? Oh, wow, that, that's hard. I mean, I think, I think that uh, medical students spend way too much time just memorizing things and studying things that have become largely irrelevant because there's a history of studying them, and there's uh, you know powers that be in the medical school that want you to keep studying them, and so there's no time for new disciplines like uh, 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 evolutionary theory to work to work their way in. I mean, it's it's not that a lot of doctors, especially thoughtful ones in running medical schools and so on, don't think that well this is important, but you know if it's not on the major exams that we all take. Uh, uh, it's hard to devote a lot of time to that. So, so I would say f finding out ways to make more time for uh, uh, evolution to be taught in medicine is, is the key. I want to go back to senescence for a minute. So yeah. I agree. <coughs> 
I agree that it seems to be a big problem to keep your Ferrari running. And um, <laughs> of course, it, it's not just a Ferrari. Your, your Ford Escort, you're not going to keep running for 50 years either because right. as we all know, you know, at some point you keep taking it back into the shop over and over mm -hmm. and the cost of repairs is starting to get so ridiculous. Yeah. And when you look at it over time, you start calculating it. Oh my gosh. Exactly. It would, have, it would have been cheaper for me yeah. to buy a new car. Yeah. Now, I know there are people who don't like the machine analogy. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's really useful. Mm -hmm. We just have to remember that it's an analogy, and mm -hmm. so right. we have to think what we can learn from the machine analogy and how we could put that then in biochemical termino terminology of mm -hmm. synthesis and catabolism and so on. Uh -huh. And... Um, I thought a lot about this. You, of course, you know I've been thinking about aging for a long time. Mm -hmm. Why you can't keep? Why isn't it cheaper to just keep your old car running than ultimately to to junk it and buy a new one? Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, unless you could go in and tear down the entire car at one time and replace all the parts, mm -hmm. what you end up having to do is repeatedly go in and tear down pieces of the car that you already tore down a few weeks ago, you know. Uh -huh. You're uh -huh. going to replace the sprockets on the transmission. You have to get into the whole transmission. But then two months later, you're going to replace the axle, and you've got to take apart the transmission again. And right. when you add all that right. up, yeah. you end up doing a ridiculous <laughs> amount of repetitive, redoing stuff over and over again to get access to the pieces that you want to yeah. replace. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I, mean, I, at some I point wonder if we, I mean, I don't know that much about the biochemistry of synthesis, but... Is there an analogy for why re rebuilding piece, half of the cell at a time or a quarter of the cell at a time and then the other quarter and so on is way more expensive than just saying, forget it, let this cell age and let's well, get I mean, rid of it I think it, it involves lots of scratch. turning on and off of lots of genes. Uh, you know, I mean, that's what the differentiation pathway is all about. And so I think, you know, going back and, re and redoing it and redoing it and redoing it, there, there also, cancer could also f uh, uh, fit into this to some degree. Uh, you know, if you're uh, uh, turning cells on and off constantly and making new, new copies, new replacements and so on, uh, you're leaving the door open to uh, uh, cancer development. That could be part of the, the equation here. Um, but but I don't know. But I mean, I agree with your original point that yeah, it's 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 it, it's something like 30 times more expensive to go to auto repair shops and buy all the parts and assemble a, a car than it is to buy one originally that's put together by the factory. So so the factory does it in an efficient way, and I think the body does it in an efficient way the first time it doesn't, and because of all those things you were saying, you got to redo this and take apart that and redo it again, uh, it becomes very inefficient. Last urgent question. Okay, thank you very much, Paul.